Hello and welcome to Hysteria. I'm Erin Ryan. And I'm Alyssa Mastromonico. Alyssa, what is the most humane way to euthanize a conversation? A yawn. (laughs) Oh, you think that's going to end it? Sometimes looking at your watch, faking a Zoom you have. (laughs) (laughs) Faking a phone call? Yeah, sure. I think like faking getting a text message and saying like, I'm sorry, I got to whatever. So sorry, I got to go. But like I, I'm I'm talking like what's a topic you can bring up where people are going to be like, I don't want to talk to this oh. person anymore. Uh, Donald Trump. I think he's the quickest way to kill a convo. Yeah. Yeah. I think Donald Trump recession. I think if you talk about recession. Also good. Also among good. Regu- among just normal people that who – You know, it's not their job to talk and write about politics and current events. Bring up recession. People are going to be like, all right, well, got to get good to see you. Catch you next time you're at the Agway. Another one was um, my my kid recently had pink eye. Bringing up pink eye is a really good way. (gasps) That is tremendous. Thank you. Except just call it conjunctive itis to be more dramatic and feel more contagious. Yes, absolutely. What's up this week, Alyssa? What's up for news? Aaron. You and I have said for weeks, we don't want 2024 starting until 2024, but we're being forced to pay attention because it's everywhere. And I am not afraid to admit that, because I do feel like we need to know the enemy, right? So Mm -hmm. I have been watching some of these town halls. I have been paying attention. And uh, let me say, if we were not aware, Nikki Haley is terrible for women. Okay. Terrible for women. Okay. She was an artful dodger during her CNN town hall. And at first blush, I will admit, was sounding terrifyingly reasonable. But she's not. During the event, she said she doesn't want people who get abortion to face the death penalty. Thanks, oh, girl. Wow. But she so does, reasonable. But she does support a six-week abortion ban, which we've made clear is stupid and could still result in jail time. She also said she believed abortion was a personal choice, but again, six-week abortion ban. Uh, She also said that one in three teenage girls are suicidal because of trans women in sports, which is just funny considering about 1.4% of U.S. youth ages 13 to 17 are trans. She also said that trans women in sports are the greatest threat to women this generation. What? What? Aaron. Okay, Nikki Haley, Aaron. you love you love women's sports so much. Name three professional women's sports teams. That's all I'm asking. Name three That's, professional women's sports teams. If you care can't. about women's sports so much. Ugh. She, anyway. She also, she attacked Trump. She attacked DeSantis. Very enjoyable. But in general, was just holy wolf in sheep's clothing vibes. Saying you thought January 6th was a bad day and that Trump thought it was a good day does not make you an American hero. <laughs> No. Oh, man. And then later this week, and I don't know if it's pay attention or mute your televisions and Twitter feed, which I think you and I aren't even really on Twitter anymore. Trump, Pence, and DeSantis will speak at the uh, North Carolina GOP convention, along with the likes of Blast from the Past Christian Coalition founder Ralph Reed. Whoa. Uh, That is Blast. Oh, he's back. He's He's back. back. See? He's only considered the, a headliner. Only the good die young, Alyssa. Honestly. Uh, and just in case, I mean, I think this could maybe be a little funny, but just as the Fulton County prosecutor's election interference probe heats up in Georgia, Trump and other election denials, uh, deniers will take the stage at the GOP conference this weekend with a Friday night keynote from Nut Nut Carrie Lake. Oh, God. I- it is... GOP news is so boring and so awful, but at the same time, it's like they take up all the oxygen. News outlets can't help but talk about them, and they're not even unique or funny anymore. Like in 2016, it was like, oh my God, can you believe what Trump is saying? They all say it now. It's not unique. It's not anything. It's just fucking racist and bad. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Yeah, it's, it's, it's like disappointing, but not unexpected. Um, There's a lot going on in the states right now like yeah. and and i feel like national media is so horny to cover national candidates that they're not like i don't know man like we talked about minnesota last week we yeah. you know there's stuff a lot of stuff happening in texas florida you know we don't really get much contextual coverage from national news outlets i mean i would say there's some exceptions um but instead we're covering like every time nikki haley takes a dump like and 
like, who even knows if she's going to be a candidate in two months? Like, remember Scott Walker? Oh, was, Scott he, Walker, Michelle Bachman, everybody. There are there is so much ebb and flow. Remember Trump at the beginning of twenty sixteen? Yeah, no, or in twenty fifteen. It was June 2015. twenty twenty fifteen. Right, and like Scott Walker when he came into the the race in July twenty fifteen was viewed as like he was going to be the front anointed. Yeah, and then he then he dropped out like less than a Kardashian later. It was like literally a couple weeks. Like, and I got to say, the threshold that the RNC has announced for making the debate stage for the big GOP debates, oh, Lordy, they're going to be three tiers of those debates. Aaron, they're going to start at noon before they get to the prime time. There are going to be so many. Here's something that I don't get about the six-week abortion ban, if we can talk about that for a second. Mm. Because, first of all, it's you really only been pregnant for two weeks. When you're right. six weeks pregnant, you have only physically been pregnant for two weeks. And a right. lot of people don't even know they're pregnant. Um, I'm just going to – I'm going to go ahead and say that I think a six-week abortion ban will actually lower the birth rate. And here's why. Um, because I think if you have longer to think about it, like you're not going to like if you find out you're pregnant and you're not sure you want to be pregnant, but it's a six week abortion ban and you're just going to like. You're like, you know what, I'm on the fence, but like I just six weeks, not a big deal, not that much time out of my life. I think if the I think that when people have a more humane amount of time to think about it, it also gives them time to make a decision that makes sense for them. I'm not saying that people are going to change their minds, but like if you have a decision between two things and one will dramatically change your life and one will dramatically not change your life and you have two weeks to make the decision, the safer decision is the one that will dramatically not change your life, right? Right. I think that this will make a lot of people who would have otherwise chosen eventually or gotten to a point where they're like, okay, I'm comfortable. I I want to have this this baby. I think that this is going to force them to choose to have an abortion like earlier than yeah, yeah. and and they wouldn't have otherwise. Um, I I don't well their think... their hand is being forced exactly exactly like I mean if you put yourself in that situation and you're like six weeks pregnant you got to make the decision by then you're just you're gonna do it you know yeah like I would think so <laughs> I, I guess they're just counting on. Women not being able to access, you know, things – if what they're trying to do is to goose the birth, birth rate and make people – force people to give birth, um, a six-week abortion ban is only going to, to cause more abortions, honestly. Um, and then more unsafe abortions because then once people – if people miss the deadline and they're like, I don't want to have this baby, they will do – stop it basically nothing. They will still have an abortion. Exactly. They will st- they'll still have an abortion. The, the, the horse is out of the barn there. People know how right. to do it. Like that, that cake is baked. You're not, you're not gonna be able to like make it so that people suddenly don't know how to self-administer right. an abortion. Um, okay, yeah, Nikki Haley does suck. I honestly, if she were a man, she would be a lot more fearsome as a candidate. Um, I think that that is because of the GOP base. I don't think the GOP base will elect a woman who has any sort of vibes of reasonableness ever. Yeah, no, I think that's right. They're more Carrie Lake than Nikki Haley. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Yeah. Carrie Lake would get a lot further in Republican primaries than a Nikki, Nikki Haley. Um, ooh, this is a fun, this is a fun one. Um, we're going to talk about our pal Harlan Crow. <laughs> Suddenly everywhere. Oh. Suddenly everywhere. Um, I'm just going to quote the Jezebel article that that was about this because it's it's brilliant writing. Here's an extremely cursed sentence. Billionaire and Clarence Thomas benefactor Harlan Crow donated $500,000 to Barry Weiss to start an anti-woke nonprofit. Weiss is one of two journalists Elon Musk, Musk handpicked to report out the Twitter files and founder of the, quote, independent, not independent, transphobia peddling outlet, the free press. The nonprofit, Alyssa Get a load of this. This is what it's going to be called. FAIR, the Foundation Against Intolerance and Racism. Hey, I agree with those things. I think intolerance and racism are bad. Hey, that sounds great, However, interesting. Harlan Crow, notorious Nazi artifact collector. (laughs) Hmm. Well, huh. Makes sense. Okay. Hmm. I'm scratching my chin here. Um, I feel as though, much like if there were a club 
called the Sex Havers Club. You'd be like, no one in this club has sex. Um, I feel like the people who are interested in FAIR, the Foundation Against Intolerance and Racism, are actually, in fact, opposite. They are super yeah. in favor of intolerance and racism. Uh, this, the thing that I think is the funniest about this dumb thing, first of all, Barry Weiss is not smart enough to do this. Um, she's just not. Uh, just, but it's my exhausting. Favorite, the level of confidence that she has is in you it's like ridiculous it's like man confidence which is why like i've told you before Alyssa, i think we need to strive not for a world where all women have the confidence of men but where men have less confidence i think men yes should, their confidence should come down to the confidence of the average woman because otherwise we get this dumb shit um barry weiss wanted fair oh. to replace the aclu <laughs> Can you imagine? Could you imagine saying that shit out loud? Yeah. Um, cool. Uh, yeah, I'm going to I'm going to replace uh, I don't know. What's what's something I could pot probably Really replace? really don't want Barry Weiss deciding my civil liberties. No. <laughs> Thank you so much. Other people and here in case you're just like, I don't know, give Barry a shot. Here are other people that were on the fair board of advisors. Oh. <laughs> Former Fox host and Caucasian Santa enthusiast Megan Kelly, um, <laughs> disgraced writer Andrew Sullivan, and activist Christopher Rufo. Alyssa, if you were like sitting in a waiting room and you looked around and you saw that the other people in the waiting room were Megan Kelly, Andrew Sullivan, Christopher Rufo, and Barry Weiss, what would you think? That Zocdoc had failed me. <laughs> <laughs> I would think I'm in hell. I'm dead. Yeah. I'm in hell. I mean, I'm at the wrong doctor. <laughs> I'm yes, this is the wrong wherever wherever I am. And I do not Aaron, want to be. let us let us not forget other million dollar donor Susie Edelman, who wrote in an email. Sex based rights matter. Single sex spaces for women and girls must be protected. Transgenderism is a fiction designed to destroy. What, Susie? <laughs> What are you talking about, Susie? No kids care. Like here's here's a like it's no. all these like creepy old people being like girls don't want this and it's like I don't know, why don't you have a conversation with some actual human girls and get a sense of how they feel about their classmates that are trans or non-binary? Like why don't you do that? But I don't think they actually care about no. what is no. best for children. They just want to erase LGBTQ people from existing. What um, an exhausting endeavor we had to learn something about. Yeah. I can I just like get those brain cells back. Ugh. What what else is going on, Alyssa? Oh, you know what? Fucking Amazon. Like, honestly, I just wonder what PR people at Amazon do, other than make somewhat bad decisions. Amazon fired Jennifer Bates, a worker and union organizer from Bessemer, Alabama. Okay. She had been on medical leave. You may remember her, Erin. She was the face of the movement down in Alabama. We saw her on TV all the time. She's been on medical leave. Amazon terminated her job because she hasn't been working despite her leave being protected. Uh, according to the retail wholesale and department store unit uh, union, she will appeal, which she should do. Bates – Here's the best part. She's not the first union organizer that's been fired from that exact Amazon Fulfillment Center. Daryl Richardson, who many say started the union drive in Bessemer, was fired back in January. And in other union news to watch, UPS, which is responsible for transporting 6% of the GDP in the United States with its 340,000 workers, may strike at the end of June. Oh, I like our UPS guy. I love I, I, my UPS people. It's I, like, I hope, you know, I'm glad they're unionized. Unlike other uh, package delivery services, UPS right. is actually unionized. Um, well, yeah. I mean, it'll, it'll be a, it'll Go ahead. I was going to say, something tells me that Amazon is going to hope that the UPS settles their uh, negotiation so there's not a strike. <laughs> yeah, Just saying. All right. Let's take a quick break. When we come back, we've got this week's interview. And Alyssa, I hear you're flying solo. Ah, only because you let me. 
Welcome back to Hysteria, the podcast where there is always madness to our method. Our guest today is the first female and first queer congressperson from Vermont. Before heading to Washington, she was a member of the state Senate, helping to pass gun laws and make affordable housing more accessible. She's also a mom, a teacher, and a rock star at karaoke, which we will get to. Please welcome Representative Becca Phelan. Thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to be here. First, happy Pride Month. Thank you. I love Vermont, the Green Mountain State. You may not know this about me, but I was a proud catamount at the University of Vermont in my early college years. I, I did not for- know that. Oh, yes. I have spent a lot of time in the great Green Mountain State. I campaigned for Bernie, and I met Howard Dean when he was going dorm to dorm registering voters. Becca, I have always thought that Vermont is the best state, but how is it that you're the first woman elected to Congress from Vermont? Yes, I know. I get asked that a lot. So, you know, we only have, we're tiny, we're schminky, as my son says, we're schminky. We only have three uh, members of Congress total, right? So we have one House member and two senators, and we've been well served for years. And uh, Senator Leahy was in the Senate for almost 50 years. Right. Bernie's had a long career. Uh, now Senator Welch was in the House prior. So there is, um, you know, there's an, an issue just in terms of what uh, seats are open. And, you know, there is that thing about sexism and what people think women can do there. You know, there's, there's that as well. Um, and I I just couldn't be more proud to be the first woman, the first queer person to represent Vermont. And yes, it was it was long overdue. But um, we've been well served. Both things are true. You just mentioned you're also only one of three queer women in the house. Yes. How do you all celebrate Pride? Oh, well, we... We do like to do karaoke, at least two, 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 two of the three of us do. Um, but we also, it's funny, the three of us also play on the bipartisan women's softball team, which I know is like so stereotypical. It's insane. But like, yeah, the, the three queer women are playing on the softball team. And, are you and- kidding? <laughs> Senator Kirsten Gillibrand, especially when she was in the house, one of my good friends, she uh, she was always on the softball team. So oh, yeah, the she's the pitcher. for everybody. Yeah, she's yeah like- she pitches for us. Yeah. I, yes. She says it's one of the greatest times, one of the greatest parts of being a member. I agree. It is a fun time, seven o'clock in the morning, all of us together on the, on the field. It's pretty fun. It's dedication. Speaking of dedication, conservatives have currently been making it their life's work to attack LGBTQ rights, especially the rights of trans kids, with a lot more vitriol lately than even we're used to. What has it been like fighting their queer phobic bills in the House? Oh, it's awful. It's absolutely awful. And, you know, one of the things I would want your listeners to know is this didn't happen by accident. This was planned. This was a strategic uh, decision that was made by the GOP. Who are we going to go after next? And the New York Times did a really great profile of this um, probably a month and a half ago. And so they really wanted to find an issue that would rally their base And what they picked on uh, are trans kids and their families. That's, I mean, it is completely cynical and cruel. And to see it day in and day out is very disheartening. But the thing that has been giving me a lot of strength and inspiration is when those families come to Capitol Hill to talk to us about their experiences and what they need from us to stand up for them as Americans and as parents. And so one of the hardest parts for me is seeing that um, the GOP will bring this issue into any committee hearing, even if it has nothing to do with trans rights, queer rights, you know, pride, whatever. Like, for example, yesterday on a hearing related to um, known as ESG investing principles, mm-hmm. right? We're talking about investments and they managed to bring it into that. It. It's constant, it's cruel, and it was completely and totally premeditated. And I'm just glad that I'm here as, as a voice for people who, who don't feel like they have a voice right now. And it's, it's some of the most important work I'm doing right now, honestly. 
Do you have any allies on the other side of the aisle? I mean, is everyone basically just towing the party line, I guess, if this is the party line? Or are there any people who are willing to work with you and acknowledge that this is utterly uh, abhorrent? We haven't heard those voices. Mm. We haven't heard, not, not, not here on, on Capitol Hill. Uh, they had, you know, unanimous votes on their anti-trans bills um, some weeks ago. The only Republican I can think of nationally that has staked out a position that is, is much, um, more, more kind and understanding is the Republican governor of Utah, uh, Cox. Um, he had some really great statements, but he is a lone voice right now. On Tuesday, a judge narrowly blocked a Florida ban on gender-affirming care for trans kids, including a statement that said, quote, gender identity is real. What can we take away from this small victory? Well, I was actually with the, the kids and, and parents when that ruling came down and we were talking about it in the room, and they do feel like it is a, a glimmer of hope. But I think there is a real strong misunderstanding nationwide about what we mean when we say gender affirming care, because gender affirming care at a young age is really as simple as a parent, a teacher, um, a role model in a child's life saying, you know, to that uh, young man or woman, I see you, I love you, you know, whatever your identity is, I'm going to be here for you. And that's what the majority of what we're talking about, the younger ages, when we say gender affirming care. And it's only much later with lots of conversations with uh, primary care providers and psychologists and the parents, if there is a, a next step around um, puberty blockers or anything like that. But the, the basic essence of this is showing kids love and support. And that should not be something that we're talking about here in Congress, honestly. Definitely not. It's something that probably should be handled at home or in schools where they also just want to ban everything and make sure that kids don't have support anywhere they are going. That's right. I mean, this is the party of freedom, right? Supposedly. And they're so banning books. Much and freedom. They're talk <laughs> so much freedom. I'm 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 so tired of the amount of freedom I have right now. It's really good it's, that they're they're really uh putting some restrictions on it because it's it's gotten a little too crazy. It's true. I mean, thank God they've gone so far as to ban that fascist Judy Bloom from being in libraries. <laughs> it's terrific. Okay, Becca, I am a lifelong Springsteen fan. I know that you can't start a fire without a spark. There's been incredible footage of you singing karaoke on Twitter. A little Bruce Springsteen dancing in the dark, some other stuff. You have been karaokeing with members of Congress. Your enthusiasm is real. What do you Thank love? You. And like, I have to say, like, I watched all the videos. You crush oh. karaoke. What are your go-to karaoke <laughs> songs and why do you love it so much? Oh, these are great questions. <laughs> um, first of all, I'm a very joyful person. And, and I have to find my joy even in this really hard job. And I, I love getting people to laugh and sing along, whatever it is that I'm doing. And so karaoke is great for that. So I have um, one go-to song that I love to do with my, my colleague, Sharice Davids. Um, we sometimes do ACDC, You Shook Me All Night Long, which Ooh. is, <laughs> we, we crush, we crush. You bring the house um, down with that one. <laughs> yeah. So I love that one. I love, um, Thunder Road and Born to Run are, are, are really good ones, but I'm also, you know, I'm, I've been known to do a Dolly Parton number or Spice Girls. Um, I, I pretty much, uh, Garth Brooks, I, I'm there for you. Whatever it is that you need me to do, you know, whether it's in a group or a duo, um, I just, <laughs> I just love to be joyful. Yeah. I have to tell you, for all of the years uh, when I worked in the White House, in my office, it was known that there was usually a 5 p.m. dance party. Like, we knew we weren't going home anytime soon. I would crank up yes. the radio. I always had music on. And for 15 minutes, we would just dance to whatever. And it honestly made everything so much better. And when one of my dear colleagues left, he wanted to do a karaoke party. 
And so we went for karaoke and Jen Saki and I made the biggest karaoke fail of all time. We oh, did Proud Mary. We did Proud <laughs> Mary to adorable white girls. And it was seven minutes long. And by the end, we were legitimately winded. I was like, that was a terrible idea, Saki. What did we do? So I have been loath to do anything more than like two minutes when I have karaoke. Right. Well, I, I really appreciate everything that you just said right now, because sometimes <laughs> there, there is a, a number that doesn't doesn't quite work. And especially if you're, you're trying to catch your breath. And, you know, we have dance parties in this office here too. Um, usually they're just five minutes long, but I will, I yeah. will make my, my very awkward staff come in. Sophie, the comms person, she will always be ready to dance. Other people just kind of do these, like, uh, you know, we're kind of oh. dancing. I'm like, no, no, come on, get it out. Listen, get it out. when I took dance classes when I was quite small, my mother always said that my enthusiasm trumped my skill. So <laughs> that's, I think, yes. how everyone should live their dance lives. Wait, I have one last question for you before we let you go. Yes. We understand that your wife is an opera singer. Do you two she harmonize is. at karaoke? Do you harmonize? She, well, so here's the thing about my wife. She is an attorney by day, but at night she is not only an opera singer. She is an aerial fabric artist. That's so amazing. She does them together. Yes. So she's going to be performing at the Providence Fringe Festival uh, next month. Um and she's going to be up in the silks on, on her aerial circus rig singing opera. And so, um, we, we do sing together, not opera, but we both play guitar and we sing. And, um, actually, oh my, we, we could have a whole other conversation. We have, <laughs> um, a whole series of historical parodies that we wrote when no. I was a middle school teacher. Yeah. So I got a million of them. Um, and so we, we did a lot of singing together and my son who's 15 now has just started to learn about them. And he said the other day, you wrote a song about the black plague. I was like, yes, it was very catchy. It was to free to be Shut you and me. Up. And I mean, we were ahead of our time. Let <laughs> me tell you something, proof that Vermont should have sent a queer woman to Congress ages ago. Congresswoman Becca Ballant, thank you so much for joining us here on Hysteria. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Have me back. Oh, we'll have you back. <laughs>